Hi everybody, it's Mr. Alsop again, coming to you from my amazing living room studio. Today we're going to do a little bit more science work and we're going to talk about some things that I find really interesting in middle school science. Uh, and, and this day we're going to take a look at how we actually do science. So what is it that we do when we make an experiment? How is it that we put together what we think is science? And in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about a lot of different things. But I think it's really important that we do it because you're at home right now and you have the ability to do science, to do real science on your own and to make real advances in science on your own at home. And so I'm really excited to teach you guys about this stuff because I feel like it will help to maybe make you feel like you could try out some new scientific things all on your own and learn a little bit more about what it's like to be a scientist because I feel like you all can be scientists and you can all do science at home uh, all on your own. So what I want to look at today is what is science. Uh, and this gentleman in this picture over here, his name is Steve Burns, um, and he's the founder of a company called VP Racing Fuels. Some of you might have heard of him, especially those of you who drive around on your dirt bikes all the time or who go to the racetracks that we have around here and watch people racing on the dirt tracks and things like that. Um, and he is one of my personal favorite scientists. Um, he started his company all on his own, and we're going to talk about how he did that and what he did that makes him such an amazing scientist and such a really cool example for all of you as to how you can become really great scientists, even without a whole heck of a lot of scientific training. So first up, we have to figure out what science really is. And the first thing I always talk about when I talk about science is science is a way that we do something. So a lot of people, when they say science, they start thinking about, well, science is the earth and science is rocks and science is animals and science is chemicals and science is this and science is that. And when it really comes down to it, science is not really things. Science is a way that we do something. And in particular, science is a way that we ask questions. So every good scientist has a question, something they've thought of that makes them go, hmm, I wonder what, or hmm, I wonder why, or hmm, I wonder how. There's something that they have that's a question that they want to find an answer for. And so science is that way that we ask those questions and then answer those questions. So when we have a question and we're trying to figure out an answer, a lot of you, your first step trying to figure out an answer to a question is research. You go and look it up on the internet. You go and you talk to people and you ask people about it. Science is a way that we can ask questions that we don't know the answers to and try to find out the answers to those questions. Now, as scientists, we're not always right. A lot of times we get the answers wrong and we have to go back and try again and again and again and again until we find those right answers. So science is a way that we ask those questions, a way that we answer those questions and a way that we repeat that process. So let's take a look at something. Let's take a look at how we really do science. And this is something called the scientific method. Now, when we look at this, a lot of you immediately look at that and go, uh, and then you go into overload and you're like, I, I don't get any of what just appeared in front of me. I am currently overloaded. Please take this more simply and talk to me about the different parts of science. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take all of that. We're going to try to break it down. We're going to make it simple because you've all been doing science your entire lives. You just might not have realized that you're doing it. And you've all been following that scientific method. We, as human beings, we naturally are born scientists. As soon as we're out and, and crawling around on the floor, we are scientists. 
I think one of my favorite examples is, you know, you're walking through the kitchen and as you're walking through the kitchen, you look over on the counter and you see, oh, hey, look, over on the counter, there's a bowl of something. Let me take a look what's in that bowl. And you take a look and you see what's in the bowl and you, you sniff it and you go, hmm, I wonder if that's dinner. Well, at least that's what happens to me a whole awful lot. But that's the first step in a science experiment. The first step in a science experiment is just observation. It's using our senses to try to experience the world around us. And that experience is going to cause us to have questions. So we might be seeing something. Um, you see, I've got a little eye there for seeing. We might be seeing something out in the world. We might be smelling something out in the world. You might be, you know, smelling your little brother or sister and, and wondering if maybe they need a diaper change. That's a question. That's science. You're going to have to figure that one out. You might see something like I did with the bowl of food on the counter. You might hear something like a crash from your bedroom. Did your little brother or sister just knock something over in your room? Are they in there messing around with your stuff? I know this is uh, truth for those of you who are in quarantine right now and, and have to stay at home. <sighs> They're into your stuff all day, every day, and we know it. But that's what we're doing. We're observing things in science. We might taste something and have questions about something because of the way it tastes. We might touch something and have questions about something because of the way that it feels. We might wonder about, hey, why does that feel that way? What is it about it that makes it feel like that? Why do ice cubes feel cold? Those kinds of things, those kinds of questions, all come from these initial observations. Now, we have to be careful. In science classrooms, it's not always appropriate to do all of these things. Uh, we have to be very careful. We have to talk to our science teachers before we start doing these things. I'm sure your science teachers have already given you those instructions. Uh, look with your eyes before you are doing anything else. Um, there are some things where in science class we're going to tell you, do not look directly at the eclipse. Okay, we might tell you that that observation form is not appropriate for what we're observing. We might tell you, please don't sniff what's in this beaker because it might be toxic. It might damage you. It might damage your nose. It might potentially cause problems with your breathing. So please don't just stiff your, stick your nose into something that's in the classroom and stuff your nose in there and sniff because it could turn out very badly for you. Um, hearing, we might ask you to listen to something in the classroom, to listen to the way something sounds. Um, you might be doing this outside. I know I spend a lot of times out in the woods, and when I spend a lot of time out in the woods, a lot of times my first sense that detects something that's interesting is hearing. I hear a snap of a twig or a rustle of a leaf. And that makes me want to go investigate and makes me want to go see what was that. That's an observation and that's the start of science. For naturalists and biologists like me, that's one of the first things we look for is that, that moment where we go, ooh, what was that? That's that first part of science, that first observation. In your science classroom, your teacher may have told you this already, we don't want you tasting things unless we tell you to taste them first. So if you see a bunch of beakers on a table with interesting looking liquids in them, don't run over and start drinking them. That's usually a very bad idea in a science classroom because what's in those may be toxic. They might be harmful to you. They might even be poisonous. And so we don't want you getting into anything without asking your science teacher first for permission. And so when you're at home, like you are right now, your science teacher is your parents. So you need to ask them before you experiment with anything like that, before you try observing anything by drinking it or by tasting it or by smelling it or by touching it. You need to ask them if it's okay first. But generally, these are the ways that we first experience a scientific phenomenon. So when we go back to our friend from our first slide, um, who was working with racing fuels, his observation came because he was rebuilding an engine in his garage. 
And as he was rebuilding this engine in his garage, he noticed that different fuels that he was using, different kinds of gasoline from different places, caused his engine to behave very differently. And so it made him wonder something. The next step in this is coming up with something we call a hypothesis. And I'm pretty sure most of you have heard this word at some point from your science teachers. Because a hypothesis is a really big word, but all it really means is that you are making a guess. I'm waiting. Somewhere out there, there's a child with their hand up going, but Mr. Alsop, our teacher said it was an educated guess. It would be nice if it was an educated guess, but a lot of times in the real world of science, a hypothesis is just a guess. It's a guess that somebody makes based on what they see and what they think. And so it's okay to guess in science. It's okay to not have the answers. It's okay to make mistakes. The key part of science though, is that we move forward from those mistakes and we learn from those mistakes and we continue to try to get better at what we're doing so we don't end up making more mistakes. But in the case of your initial hypothesis, that guess that you're making doesn't always have to have a whole lot of research and, and uh, things to back it up because a lot of the best hypotheses in science have been about things that no one has ever really studied before. In the case of our friend from VP Racing Fuels, he had a hypothesis and his hypothesis had to do with mixing gasoline with other substances to maybe make it explode better for his engine. And so he had some guesses about some substances that might work. Now, as you can imagine, that's kind of a dangerous thing. He was working in his parents' garage and he was blowing up fuels in his parents' garage to try to get a good idea of what was happening with those fuels. Were his parents thrilled about this? Probably not. But he was doing science and he was making important advances in science because he had a guess that he could make a fuel that was better for his engine than what he was using right then. So this is something we do all the time when we make a guess about something. When I'm walking through the kitchen and I see that bowl, I make a guess, hey, I think that might be dinner. Uh, when you're out walking in the woods and you hear something rustling around in the leaves, you think to yourself, oh, that might be a grouse. You're making these guesses all of the time. The next thing that you have to do is you have to take those guesses and you have to try to, way, to find a way to see if your guess is right. And so that's where we get to experiments. And all an experiment is, is a way to see if our guess might be right or might be wrong or might be somewhere in the middle where we don't really know if it's right or wrong. When you're experimenting, you are trying to figure out if your guess works or not. And we're going to come back to how we design that experiment in a minute because that's really important. But experimentation is kind of the core of all of this. Because when you get done with your experiment, you're going to have some results. And the next thing that we do is analyze those results. Did it work? Whatever it is that we were trying to do, did it work? Did my experiment show what I wanted it to show? Sometimes our experiments are gigantic failures. That happens in science. Sometimes our experiments don't prove anything and they don't show us anything and they don't give us any new information. And so we have to think about why they didn't do anything, why they didn't work, why they didn't show us anything about what we wanted to know more about. And that's okay. That's what science is all about. We refine those experiments. We change them a little bit. We try out some different things to see if maybe that will change how the experiment went. So analysis is looking at those results critically and trying to figure out, did it work? 
did we prove anything? Did we show anything? Did we disprove anything? In science, a lot of times for us, what we would love to do more than anything else is disprove something. We would love to show that something is not true because that's a lot easier than showing that something is true. It is very, very hard in science to prove that something is true, but it is much easier to prove that something is false. And so in science, a lot of our experiments are designed to prove that something is false, which is really interesting. And it's one of the reasons why I love science. Scientists are great at this because we love failure we love doing things that don't work and we love proving that things are not correct and i think that's probably one of the most interesting parts about science is that the greatest scientists out there never discover anything they just show what's not true um, and that to me is is amazing when you have a, uh, a knowledge like that where you're contributing to society and showing people what kinds of things are out there that maybe aren't true. So analyze it, figure out whether or not it worked. Then you have to report it. So it's not enough to just do all of this science and figure things out and try to figure out what's true and what's not true and the answers to your questions and all of that. All of that is worthless and does nothing if you don't tell anyone about it. Um, there are lots of great stories in science about scientists who did experiments and worked on things and then never told anybody about it. And because they never told anybody about it, no one ever knew what they did and no one ever knew the importance of what they did. And so all of the work that they did was lost to history until someone else came along later and figured it out again. Uh, so we see this happen over and over again in science where people have figured things out, but they don't report on it. They don't tell anybody about it. They don't figure out how to get that information to other people. And it's really important to do that. And reporting in science has changed a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. It used to be that reporting in science was all about writing things down in these what we call journals. Uh, where they're peer reviewed and people look at the stuff that you do and, and pay really close attention to it and then decide on it. And it takes months and sometimes even years to get things published and to get that information out there. Now we're in the digital age. A lot of times information in science is published on the World Wide Web long before it's published in print. Some scientists are giving you their information in YouTube videos. Uh, or they might be putting their information out there in other video formats online. Uh, there's even scientists who are actually reporting their information through interpretive dance at colleges. So the report has changed a lot. So don't let yourself get hung up on the fact that, oh, I don't like writing, so maybe science isn't for me. Maybe writing isn't for you, but maybe videotaping is. Maybe putting something on the internet is. Maybe talking about it is. Um, so don't write yourself off just because you don't like to write lab reports. Reporting can be a lot more than that and a lot different than that. So it doesn't always have to be exactly what you think it might be. And then the final step in science is to try it again. We always are trying to reproduce our results. When we do something one time, that doesn't always mean that it's going to work every time. One time could just be a fluke. We all know that time on the basketball court when we turned our back to the basket and threw the ball over our head and it went swish straight through the basket. And if we only ever did that once, we would assume that that was the best way to shoot a basketball. Turn around, throw it up over our head, swish through the basket, done. That's the best way to shoot a basketball, right? It's not, because if we did that 20 times, we would find we miss a whole heck of a lot more than we hit. Whereas maybe if we got closer, maybe if we turned around and actually looked at the basket, we would be able to shoot more baskets through the basket. So 
it's not enough just to do something once. You have to do it more than once. You have to do it multiple times. And you have to see if you get the same results every time. Because a lot of times when you try a test like this, especially a science experiment, you're going to get different results as you try that experiment. So you can't always rely on the results you got the first time you tried it. When we do our experiment, we have to have groups. We don't like to do experiments with only one person. Doing an experiment with one person doesn't tell us a whole lot. Maybe that one person is just really good at what we want to experiment with. Let's say I wanted to do an experiment. And let's say my experiment involved uh, students shooting basketball hoops um, and I think that maybe you would shoot better basketball than if you had uh, M&Ms before you were shooting. That seems like a good idea, right? Like, let's, let's eat like a whole bag of M&Ms before we go and shoot for basketball. So we're going to shoot for basketball, but we're going to eat a bag of M&Ms first. That seems like a great idea. So I'm going to get 10 kids out here and I'm going to have them all eat their bag of M&Ms and then try to shoot baskets. And we're going to see how that works. And I'm going to find out that all of those kids are really great at shooting baskets. And I'm going to say, oh, they're great at shooting baskets because they all ate M&Ms. I haven't really proven anything. And the reason why is because I gave the M&Ms to all of the kids. I don't know if they got any better. I don't know if they are better than other kids who didn't have M&Ms. I don't know if they're better than they were before they had the M&Ms. I don't know much about anything from that experiment. In order to really do something with that experiment, I need to have some groups. I need to have an experimental group, and I need to have a control group. My experimental group is going to have some kind of a change done to them. My control group is not going to change. My control groups have constants, things that don't change in the experiment. So if I was trying to set up this experiment better, I might say, all right, let's take my 10 students and I'm going to put them into two groups of five. And I'm going to have those two groups of five each shoot 10 basketballs at the basket. Then I'm going to take those same groups and one of the groups, my experimental group, I'm going to change. I am going to give them some M&Ms and they're going to eat their M&Ms. And then we're going to have those same two groups shoot again. And we're going to see if there's any change in either of the groups. So my control group, we're going to see if my control group got better at shooting the second time or worse at shooting the second time. My experimental group, we're going to see if my experimental group got better at shooting the second time or if they were better at shooting the first time. I've made a change to that experimental group. I've added M&Ms to them before they did their second trial. The control group stayed constant they didn't get any changes. Now I can actually make some observations based on that. I can analyze that data and find out whether or not they got any better because of the M&Ms that they ate. This is really important when we're doing science to have these two groups. But there's something else that's really important with these two groups. And that is you can't let your experimental subjects choose their groups. If I asked the students, which group do you want to be in? Do you want to be in the M&M group or do you want to be in the no M&M group? Students might choose those groups for reasons that I might not expect. I may get five students who want to go into the control group where they don't get any M&Ms because those students are athletes and they don't like to eat candy. And so their coaches have trained them, don't eat candy. Their parents have trained them, don't eat candy. So when you ask them, do you want to be in the candy group or the no candy group? They say, I want to be in the no candy group because they're athletes. Maybe my students in the candy group are not athletes. Maybe those students in the, non -ca in the candy group eat candy all the time, don't really do much in the way of exercising, don't really do much in the way of athletics. And so now 
when I look at my results, I'm going to see a difference between those two groups. But it's not going to be because of what I did. It's going to be because those two groups are made up of two very different groups of students, a group of athletes and a group of non-athletes. And so we have to be really careful when we make our groups that we randomly put people into groups, that we don't pick them to go in the groups, that we're just getting them into the groups on a random basis. So that's another thing that we have to be sure of when we're looking at uh, how we're going to design our experiment. The final thing I want to talk about with experiments has to do with variables. Variables are the things that change during the experiment. And there are two kinds of variables that we use all the time in science. The first variable is an independent variable. And I always tell students, look at that I at the beginning of independent variable, because the independent variable is the thing that I, the experimenter, am going to change. So the independent variable in my little project was the M&Ms. I am changing the M&Ms for my students. I'm choosing to give one group of students M&Ms and not the other group. I am changing that. So the I in independent variable helps us remember that that's the thing that I am changing. The dependent variable changes because of what I did. And so it's going to be the thing that I measure. So we expect that between the first round of basketball shots and the second round of basketball shots, that we're going to have a change between those two rounds. And we're going to measure how many shots you made in the first round versus how many shots you made in the second round. That will be our dependent variable. How many shots were made is going to be our dependent variable. Our independent variable, again, remember the I, is the one we're changing, so that's whether or not you get M&Ms or not. So all of this leads us to building good experiments. So when we're trying to build a good experiment, we need to make sure we have two groups, an experimental group and a control group, and we need to make sure we have independent and dependent variables, two different kinds of variables that we're going to change one of them and we're going to measure another one. Now we can have different things that we measure. We can have multiple dependent variables, multiple things that we measure, but we should never have multiple independent variables. Independent variables, the things I change in an experiment, should be really tightly controlled. We should only ever change one thing in an experiment. We shouldn't be trying to change two or three things because then we don't know which one of those things caused our dependent variable, the thing that I measured, to change. Thank you guys for showing up and uh, hanging out with me here. I really appreciate it, and hopefully I will get a chance to be with you guys again and teach you another lesson next week.